Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Oxygen for the Soul. This week's Parsha, Parshat Lech Lecha. Um, and uh, we, you know, we started this year on an interesting note. Um, the world has changed so much in the last uh, 20 days. Um, we are um, we're still at war. Uh, the year, this is 2023. Uh, right now, today's date is October 26, 2023. And, um, you know, we've uh, been watching uh, the... Uh, horror unfold in Israel, and um, it's, uh, I've been getting questions all day from people about how do we respond, what do we do, you know, um, people are afraid, what's going to happen, how do, we be, how do we prepare, all great questions. Um, just remember that part of uh, being a Jew is, one of the greatest things about being a Jew is having an intimate relationship with history. We know that there were people throughout history that went out of their way to try to destroy us. And uh, this week's parasha, I think, is a great expression of that. Abraham Avinu, the first Jew, the patriarch. And we got to ask a whole bunch of questions to figure out what makes him so special and so unique. And I believe that there is actually a hidden message in this week's parasha about what's going on right now. Some of you may have seen that meme that, you know, we know that Abraham was born in 1948 in the Jewish calendar. The year right now, the Hebrew calendar date is 5,783. He was born in 1948, the year the State of Israel was uh, founded. Um, And he was 75 when he uh, went out, Lech Lecha, on the mission of this week's Pasha. That was the year 2023 in the Hebrew calendar. Um, We don't believe in accidents. Everything in the Torah is by design. So Abraham is commanded to uh, leave his home leave his house, his birthplace, to go out into the world, to go to the land that God will show him. And God doesn't tell him where to go. He has no idea where he's supposed to go. And yet, we see this as a tremendous amount of, uh, there are a lot of accolades that are given to uh, uh, Abraham because he was a uh, humble servant of the Lord. But let's ask some questions over here. First question is, well, what was so special about Abraham leaving his house? We know the backstory. The backstory is that his father had him arrested and he was almost killed. Um, he was thrown into the fiery furnace. We know that he had uh, two brothers, Nahor and Haran. Um, and that Nahor, uh, when he was asked by Nimrod, who was the uh, self-proclaimed king of uh, the uh, Babylonian era, uh, area at the time, uh, he said to them, worship a god. You, if, you're not a, if you're not a polytheist, you have no future. Avraham has complete focus and says, no matter what you do to me, I will not waver from my beliefs. Haran, his middle brother, who was, by the way, whose children were Lot and Sarai, right? Abraham marries his niece and he takes his nephew on as a son as well. Um, Haran ends up saying, you know what, I'm not really sure what the answer is. Do I, am I a monotheist? Am I a polytheist? Whatever happens to my older brother, Abraham, I'll respond the way he does. Now, Avram is thrown into the fire, and he survives. Haran, Haran is thrown into the fire, and what happens? He dies. And my question is, why? Was there anything, what was so terrible about the type of belief that um, Haran displayed, uh, you know, by, by supporting his brother's ideas? Yeah, that's, you know, I'm not sure. I have more, there's a kind of moral clarity I get from watching the behavior of my brother. Um, uh, he, should be, he should have been rewarded for that. Why, was he, why did he die as a result of his choice? We all agree it was the right choice, but why death? So let's try to answer like this. H- how old was Abraham when he figured out there was a God? So the Machloke, different opinions. Some people say that he was three. Some people say he was uh, 13. Some people say, like the Rambam, he was 40. It doesn't really matter, but the, there's one story that it particularly, I think, spells out uh, his realization, is that Abraham is born in a time where people are losing their sense of morality. People have adopted a, a deep belief in uh, polytheism, which means there is no morality, because you could choose any god you want to believe in, and that will make whatever you're feeling okay. You could always justify any moral action, depending on which god you want to uh, believe in. So there was no morality in that world. Now, you have a man (coughs) who comes on the scene and says, no, you're all wrong. There is a clear sense of morality in the world, 
and there's one creator. How does he come to that conclusion? He comes to this conclusion by taking, around, uh, taking a look around the universe and saying, this did not happen by accident. Everything around us is by design. And if you see design, you know there is a designer, right? If there's a designer, there's someone here that created all of this for a reason. And we believe that God creates the world as an act of kindness. The kindness is that you and I have the ability to see, to hear, to listen, to feel, to touch, to, to be loved, to choose. These are all gifts from God. We could have, God could have created everyone like an ant or a jellyfish. You know, you could have had a very different kind of existence. But the existence that we have, when we look at the rich world that you and I live in, it is a blessing. God didn't have to create color. God didn't have to create sight. You could have just imagined human beings not being able to see, but just hearing. Who says you have to see? You put antlers on your head so you could feel the world around you, but don't see anything, right? Possible. But God created us in a way where we could have a maximum expression of this world and see and feel and hear the beauty and the nuance that it provides for each of us. And it should humble us. The feeling that we should have when we look out at the world is, wow, it's beautiful. The soil of the planet is designed specifically to create life. The microbes and the earth are there to help support the life. The oxygen, the carbon dioxide, that's the, in, the, the inter interdependent relation between the living organisms and the trees is a perfect balance. The plankton in the ocean and the, and the sea in the ocean, and it, the whole entire thing is a planet that is designed for life. And Abraham looks at all of it and he says, there is a creator, an intelligent being, a designer that put all of this into action. It's no accident here. The, the scientists want you to believe that if, uh, if you have an, uh, anything with a long enough amount of time, eventually you'll get to whatever conclusion you want. I disagree. And when I hear that, you know what my response is? Well, they say if you put like all the uh, ingredients for life in a uh, closed uh, room, and you blow it up over and over again, eventually you'll have all the ingredients working together. Uh, and you hear that, 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 that idea, though, if I, if I have enough, if I take all the parts of a Boeing 747 and I put it into a room and I blow it up over and over again, eventually you're going to have a plane. If I have a, trillions and trillions of times, eventually you have a plane. And I, I agree with you that you might have a plane, but would you fly it? <laughs> I'm not flying that plane. I'm not getting on a plane that happened accidentally. I'm getting on a plane where you had engineers who were thinking about every single inch of how that plane is balanced and perfect and so on and so forth. Abraham looks at the world and he says, my friends, there is a God, there is a creator. There is nothing in our lives that happens accidentally. It is there by design. Abraham recognizes this. He has a vision. And what does he see? He sees a palace on fire. The palace in the desert represents order. The fire is what we're here to do. You and I are here to recognize that if we leave the world on its own, it will burn itself to the ground. And Abraham recognizes that his purpose here is to be someone who is lech lecha, going into himself, going into a place where he's working on developing a better, greater version of himself so that he can make the world around them better. Because if you don't do that, the world gets worse. And look at the world we're in right now. The world that you and I are living in right now is an expression of humanity not growing. A world of people that have put in zero effort into getting the moral clarity to understand what is right and what is wrong. It's, none of this makes sense. You have uh, you know, the intersectionality uh, and the support for Hamas is, is fascinating. You have the LGBTQ plus you know, uh, community supporting uh, you know, uh, Palestine and, uh, and Hamas, um, but if they were in Gaza, they'd be killed immediately. <laughs> that makes no sense. And when they find out what's actually going on, it's, it's amazing. They have no idea what's going on. And how many people are finally waking up to the reality that, oh my gosh, you know, America's not the same place. What happened to the leaders? Where's the support? Why are Jews on campus uh, unable to get the, uh, the safety that they need to be able to just be a normal student on campus without feeling threatened. You know, these students, I'm getting phone calls from kids all day. They're not going to school. They're afraid to go to classes. There's zero support from the university. No one's saying anything. It's okay tearing down posters of babies that were kidnapped. It's not normal. It's a lack of moral clarity. By the way, 
This is not the first time this has happened. You know what would happen to? It happens to Abraham. Imagine living in a world where you're the only person on the planet that believes in a monotheistic idea. And the whole world is telling you, you are a fool. You're, 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 you're so ridiculous. You're so wrong. Everyone said he was wrong. No one agreed with him. And he had no rabbis. There was no one for him to go to talk to. He was alone. Yes, Shem and Eber were there, but he did not have access to them. He was a lone student of, of, of peace, of love, of chesed, of kindness, of monotheist, who wanted to change the world, but he was alone. There was no one there to support him. And I want, I want to go through one piece in this week's parasha, which I think is like, it fits in so beautiful into everything that's going on right now. And I think it's a message of hope. This is God doing, because this whole conflict could have started in Pasha Vayikra with the laws of sacrifices, but it didn't. Right? It's in the middle of Lech Lecha. Right? <coughs> so this is what I think is Hashem telling us. The story goes like this. After Abraham, uh, you know, goes through his first test. First test is he goes through, what? Leave the land. Number two is, up. Oh, there's a famine. There's been no famine in the world that Abraham came from. He lived in Mesopotamia. It's called the Fertile Crescent. He never experienced a famine in his life. There was no famine before that. He has no idea what's going on. God tells him to go to this land, and there's, there's no food. He's forced to go to Egypt. He goes south. He's, his wife is taken as captive. She's freed. He leaves. Fine. He and his uh, nephew have a uh, dispute about their honesty. They separate. Lot goes to the five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he plants himself there. Abraham goes his own way, stays in the land of Israel. And um, what ends up happening is that there's a massive war all of a sudden, out of nowhere. And Chachamim tells us this is the first war mentioned in the Torah. There was no war like this before. It says, Who was Amraphel? Amraphel, Rashi tells us, based on the Midrash, is who? Nimrod. Nimrod is the guy that threw Abraham into the fiery furnace, right? So he starts a war, and he has four kings that go into war against the five kings. And these four kings are so powerful that they overtake the five kings. Okay, so fine. They go to this war start. We have no idea why this war started. But they assume Milchama in Bera Melch Sodom. They go to the place where Lot is settled. We know the last thing we know is Lot's in Sodom. And now this war is taken to Sodom. Okay, remember, these, uh, uh, Amraphel is in, is in Bavel. He's in, in, all the way in, 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 uh, in Baghdad, in that region. He's in, he's in Iraq. Why is he coming all the way down from there to fight a war for some land and territory in the, uh, in the Dead Sea area? Why is he there? Okay, the Asum al doesn't tell us. They make a war. They come to this place called the Value of Sidim. Who Yam Hamelach, and that's where the, that's where the Dead Sea is. That area is where this war takes place. So they are fighting there for twelve years, okay. And on the thirteenth year, okay, they uh, finally rebel. But in the fourteenth year, uh, the war comes to an end, and it goes to this whole entire thing. Okay, nice. But they come to the land, and once they finally conquer Sodom, right, the war comes to an abrupt end, and we have no idea why. Let me ask you this: We know that Nimrod was afraid of Abraham. Why should he be afraid? One guy and one belief. Who cares? Throw him to the fire. He survives. Why, why should that bother him? He left. He left the land. Why is he coming after? Why is he going to Israel? Why is he starting this war? So, Avram, we know, could not have children. Everyone knew that he could not have children. He knew that he was married to Sarah. He wasn't marrying anyone else. And he did not have children. And therefore, everyone would make fun of Avram calling him a barren mule. No children. There's the chamor. He's this and that. They would make fun of him. He's, Ev, he's Abraham Ivri on the other side of the river alone. No one there to help him. Nimrod understands that if he, the only heir to Abraham was Lot. And therefore, if he captured Lot and destroyed Lot, there would be no future for Abraham and his philosophy. This is to the extent that he goes. You can't Lot, you get everything. But there's something else that, that Nimrod knew that was hiding in Lot that was super important to him. What was hiding inside of Lot? Does anyone know? Lot has a great, 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 great granddaughter. You know what her name was? Ruth. Who was Ruth? Great grandmother of David HaMelech. Nimrod knew that the spark of Mashiach, that a spiritual expression of Mashiach 
was hidden inside of Lot. And that only if you would get and destroy Lot, he would destroy everything of Abraham today in the present, in his time, and also in the future. So what does Abraham do? The Pasuk tells us he goes to war against the four kings, the same four kings that fought the five kings. He was alone in a small battle against an army that was much bigger, alone in the, that region of the world that we're in right now. And it was an impossible battle. And somehow, Abraham wins the war, miraculously. It makes no sense. He wins the war. He wins the war. And he frees Lot. I don't know what's going to happen. No, I'm not a prophet. But I'm confident that whatever does happen, at the end of it, we'll understand how all of this was for it, the best possible reason. I can't explain it now. I, I'm, I'm not concerned about Israel's survival. The Jewish people have survived through harder and more difficult situations. We've, we've, we've survived things without armies protecting us. We've survived conflicts without anyone standing up for us, alone. No one, no government, no people, nothing. With God's help in the situation that we're in right now, in the same way we say, in the same way that Abraham Avinu was able to overcome these four armies that attacked him in 2023 of the Jewish calendar, I know with God's help, we will vanquish any army that comes to attack us in 2023. It's not going to be very long. But there's one thing that has to be clear. Abraham had 100% moral clarity. His brother, Haran, dies. Why? Unclear what he believes in. The Maharal points out that the word Haran is made up of three letters. He, Resh, Nun. Five, 250. That's what each one of those letters represents numerically. And the Maharal points out that each letter is a midway point in the numerical system of the Hebrew letters. Remember, the, the largest number in the Hebrew alphabet is 400. Okay, so He is 5, 1 and 10, midway point. Resh is 200, 1 to 400, 200 is midway point. Nun is 1 to 50, midway point. Haran represents someone who was stuck in the middle. He did not have any clarity, did not have moral clarity. You cannot live a life as a Jew without having the moral clarity to stand up for what you believe in like Abraham. You want to be protected by the Magen Abraham, the shield of Abraham? Well, how far are you willing to go with your belief? Is it clear to you that we need to do what we need to do? Do you have the moral clarity of Abraham? Because if you don't have it, you will be, end up like, God forbid, like Haran. Now, interestingly, Haran comes back again in history, but with a different name. We added an Aleph to his name. When you add the letter Aleph to the word Haran, what word do you get? Aharon. Aleph, He, Resh, Nun. Each letter, midway point. What's the role of, of, a, of a prophet, of a uh, Kohen? The Kohen's job is to elevate the physical and to the spiritual. To be someone who's a mediator between people. That, 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 uh, he's supposed to take a, that middle ground, but he has a very clear purpose with the Aleph in the front. He has moral clarity. That's the purpose of the Kohen. To remind us of what our mission is in this world. This war that we are going through right now is one about moral clarity. If you want to be a descendant of Abraham, are you willing to stand alone and, and, and fight for your beliefs? Don't expect to have your friends helping you. They're not. You have to be willing to stand up for what you believe in and be 100% clear that what you're doing is true. If it's unclear, you will be stuck like Haran was stuck. But be mindful that, historically speaking, Jews have always chosen a moral side that is, was only later understood to be the right side of morality. We see this throughout history. Right? Jews have always were on the right side of moral decision-making. I know this is scary, I know it's complicated, but I'm also confident as long as we are firm about what we believe in, as long as we have the moral clarity to understand what our role is here, Ezrat Hashem, we will see Yeshua Hashem. We say Yeshua Hashem, Keherf Ayin. God's salvation is like the blink of an eye. Abraham had zero reason to believe that he would be successful. Zero reason to believe that he would be able to, be, uh, to win that war. But he went in because he, he had no choice. He had to go into that war. His, his nephew. He had to save his nephew. There was no, he would do anything and everything in his power to save his nephew. No questions about it. 
we have to be super clear about what we're fighting for, and uh, we should not be apologetic about it. I'm not apologizing to anything for what we're doing. I feel bad for the people that are going through pain. I feel bad for the things that are happening there, but I know my responsibility is, and anyone in the world will do the same thing. My brothers and sisters are in pain. I will do everything in my power to protect them. I don't care. We have to be morally clear. I pray and hope that the war comes to an end soon, that Mashiach reveals himself today, from Herbe Amenu, that we have the, some Rebbe power, hopefully, you know, giving us the clarity that we need to remember about our unique role in this world, and we will be blessed in the same way that Avram was blessed. The people that blessed him were blessed. The people that cursed him shall be cursed. We should see all those Yeshua Hashem, all those people that are sick and healed and lost. Our captives should be returned back to their borders, and um, let's do what we got to do. Don't give up hope. The word Ish, which means man, is an acronym for En Shum Yiush, which means if you want to be a man, there is no giving into despondency. You can never abandon hope. To be an Ish means En Shum Yiush. I will never abandon hope. I never give up. That is where our success, our success comes from. Wishing you all a Shabbat Shalom Mevarach. Looking forward to continuing the conversation next week, everybody. Kotuv and be well. Be safe. Shabbat. Shabbat.